going live now. I have to, I have to step away, so I'll be right back. I just uh, go ahead and live with go live this workshop. We're starting in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned and enjoy. It's about clean energy. So that's my task to help us understand our situation. So let me start with this. So I have a few kind of insights, see what you think. Um, right, uh, it was, I think it was, uh, you know, somebody when uh, former Vice President Cheney was asked, well, what are we gonna do if oil input, you know, from other places or kind of from the Middle East, it's gonna be hard to get, etc." He said, the American way of life is non-negotiable. So by that, he really meant this pattern of life that we're used to, our economy, we waste a lot of energy, lights left on, lots of unnecessary trips, extreme material consumption, 
and poor city planning requires even more waste of energy. And American way of life is like a big dog. You gotta feed a big dog, right? And that's what he meant. So we gotta, we're just gonna keep going. We're just gonna keep going. And of course, this is the situation we're in because that dog needs to be fed. And that's what that pipeline is for, okay? All right, so Barbara Kingsolver. How many of you know Barbara Kingsolver? Wonderful. Barbara Kingsolver recently gave a commencement address, and this is from, uh, so here's what she said. She describes this fossil fuel frenzy of our time really well, where, quote, extravagant excesses of one culture wash up as famine or flood on the shores of another. King Salbert recalled Jewel Verne's novel, Around the World in 80 Days. I don't know how many of you have read that. Um, where the hero of the novel is stranded in the mid-Atlantic on a steamship that has run out of coal. The decision is to pull up the decks and throw them into the boiler. Quote, on the next day, the masts, rafts, and the spars were burned. The crew worked lustily, keeping up the fires. There was a perfect rage for demolition. And that's what we're seeing. We're like in the middle of a perfect rage for demolition. So this first part, I'm trying to describe our situation. The second part, I'd like to share with you how we don't need to be part of this rage for demolition. There's better ways of being. So because this living arrangement that we're all in, we're all in, right, requires vast amount of fossil fuel, we're seeing extreme fossil fuel extraction all around us. The perfect rage for demolition. Blowing up, okay, so I, I, I brought a bunch of images uh, that I, I haven't kind of synchronized my text with images. So let's go for a few images. So this is it. This is <laughs> this is the lifestyle that requires a perfect range of demolition. Go ahead. And this is what the fossil fuel party looks like on a winter day. You look up, that's what you see. Next. And so that's where we are. It requires blowing up mountaintops in Kentucky. Uh, it requires blowing up the bedrock of our nation, which all of the oil that's supposed to flow in this pipeline is fracked oil. Um, and, and, and blowing up northeast Iowa and along the bluffs of the Mississippi River for frac sand, right? Land degrading practices to grow corn and beans for ethanol. These are all rage for demolition, right? Destroying the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem to extract oil. All of this stuff, all of this stuff. And of course, uh, next, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, pipelines transporting oil. Uh, and, and the worst of all, the destabilized climate. And that's, that's really what motivates me and all of us to, to uh, oppose this pipeline. We don't need any more infrastructure of this sort, right? So, uh, so it's this extreme energy extraction, it's this living arrangement that invariably requires beating up on other people and places near and far. Right? It just, it's just the nature of this economy, if you want to extract fuel, it, it requires feeding up on other places and people. And it's, it's really, so uh, a few, about five years ago, a, a well-known banker who was very generous and everything in our town, all of a sudden was jailed and he's now in a federal jail because he, was, he had started a Ponzi scheme, okay? And has, you know, has basically, uh, uh, cheated the current generation of uh, people who invested in him for a future. So, but this is the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. <laughs> this is the biggest Ponzi scheme. Uh, so, so um, we all uh, we all have heard. So, this is another thing that I, I'd like to. I think most of us can kind of play with this idea and see how we can talk to people around us in our own communities. Everybody has heard the expression, freedom isn't free, right? Yep. You know, you've heard people say, well, freedom isn't free. People 
put their lives on the line so that we can be free. Right? Everybody kind of understands that. But what people don't, but by now, right now, we should understand, it should be very clear, abundantly clear, that cheap energy isn't cheap. Right? right? right. We need to remind people that cheap energy isn't cheap, just like cheap food isn't cheap. Right. So, right? Yeah, exactly. So we need to we need to kind of, we need to keep demonstrating that the fossil energy, uh, this the fossil energy is not glamorous. <laughs> you know, it's not cool and it's dirty. We we need to kind of uh, and it's not working for us, right? So that's uh, so we don't want to be on this stuff. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We don't want any more of this pipeline stuff. We don't want we don't want to invest in this kind of infrastructure. Uh, because it, it, it's destructive of nature, destructive of democratic processes, which we just heard, and institutions of life and everything. So here is, here is uh, what went on. There's a question that I keep asking myself and I keep asking my students. Wendell Berry asks this question. He says, really referring to all the damage and destruction, to what extent do we defend from foreign enemies the country that we ourselves are destroying? It's a very tough question. So I keep thinking about that, and I keep reminding elected officials and everybody who is comfortable with this. You know. So, okay, I've been thinking a lot about this case, this is kind of my line of work. I keep thinking, well, what's my role in an educational institution? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to help people think through this? So I keep trying to figure out how to talk about this situation here and what are our options, right? Uh, a lot of us are kind of, because there's many organizations, there's 350.org, there's a place of the pipeline, there's this, there's that, there's wind energy, solar energy, how do we, how do we kind of make sense of all of this in a, how do we put all these pieces together? So uh, this is, so, uh, so this is part two. Uh, where, uh, let me see what, what's next, let me see. Okay, so we talk about, so, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll just tell you a story. As I was coming back, last night, I live in Northeast Iowa, Cedar Falls. Last, last night, there was one of those storms of our, our grandchildren's storm. It was north of Cedar Falls in Green, where less than 24 hours, they received 11 inches of rain. Right? And so they're already it's past the flood of 2008, it's a mess. Okay. The, the science is so clear. This is the work of Gene Tackley at Iowa State University. This is a very interesting, it's about intense events, right? There were huge precipitation events in the first half of century, last century, and the second half. These are, there were only two years in the first uh, half that had Years of more than eight days of three inches, uh, sorry, three centimeters, which is about uh, an inch and a quarter. Okay. In other words, we have fewer severe downpours in the second half. We had eleven, and these were actually well predicted by you know uh, climate scientists who said, "Look, we're going to see more extreme precipitation in this region of the U.S." So our climate is changing. What you're seeing is already extreme events. So next, um, and this is what it looks like. It's not glamorous. This is in Charles City, and I was on Cedar Falls City Council when we went through 2008 floods, and it just devastated parts of Cedar Falls. These are, you know, again, people. It was six feet over anything we had experienced before, which is one of these common phrases you're hearing these days, right? Well, we've never seen this before. So next. Um, so again, it's, I, I haven't synchronized my images with, with what I was just talking about. But that's what I mean. Cheap energy is cheap, right? Uh, next, uh, ocean acidification, which most people don't talk about, but that's probably the tr very troublesome related to climate change. Next. So, okay, so whoa, 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 go back. Go. Okay, so this is the beginning of what, what's our, what, what are the choices? So there are three, uh, three categories of work. So think about, okay, in the spectrum of work, 
But the, how I'm seeing it, and how we, as soon as I'm done, let's have a conversation about it. So I see three options, three options. And we had Sandra Steingraber last week at UNI, and I love the way she described. She said, we need to shut the door on fossil energy as we open the door on renewables. And we're right now in the middle. We're not in the middle. We're not in the middle. We're just trying to kind of shut. It's just mostly fossil fuel, right? And we have some good renewables kind of coming up, but we haven't shut the door. And that's like the primary thing we need to do. That's like without it, it's really hard to get anything else done. We can. People say, "Oh, well, in Iowa, we have a lot of good wind energy and everything." Yes, good, but as long as cheap fuel keeps coming, and as long as that's going on, means we're inflicting damage, and it will never. It's like that credit card. This credit card is still around, and you keep getting in trouble. If we're going to live within our means, we're going to cut up the credit card. And before we can be creative, before we kind of become humans again, <laughs> and figure out what to do, you know? Because we, we can't do it with that credit card. So she says, so we need to do this. So I thought in, in that thinking, I said, well, there's one more thing we need to do. So one, so there are three things. Ratcheting down fossil fuel dramatically, that's why we're here. We've got to stop investing. The next one is building patterns of life that lead to less energy and material. That's a totally cultural thing. We're totally capable of doing it. But as long as that credit card is there, our economy is fake, we keep doing it. We, so that's another movement we need to start. And so I'd like to think about it with you. Uh, uh, you know, having figured all this out, we all need to do it together. And the third one, of course, is opening the door on renewables, which means deploying existing energy. So those are the three things. So let me explain each one of these a little, kind of dig into each one of these a little bit. Um, British economist Schumacher in the 70s, he said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. Anybody can do that, right? Now, it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And that's really, I think, what we're here about. To move in the opposite direction means significantly reducing our dependency on fossil fuel. It's not going to be easy. Uh, divesting from fossil energy, investing in renewables. So the opposite direction means quit deficit spending or ecological capital. Right. These, are, these are the kind of that are economy that credit card, quit, quit that credit card. So what would that look like? What would this divestment look like? Let me see, oh well, no, don't change it yet. So, so everybody says, well, we need to divest. Colleges say we're going to divest. Um, so I, I, I'm very intrigued by that because we know there was a history of how we helped South Africa. Everybody said divest, and it's a great thing. And there's many scales of that. So we can divest globally. Divest nationally, <laughs> divest regionally, and community, and personally. It takes all of those things. It is very hard as long as the pipeline keeps going, right? <laughs> it's very hard, you know how Jimmy Carter said, well, you know, people should just wear sweaters, you know. Well, everybody needs to. You, know, you can't just ask for voluntary, uh, voluntary, well, you know, why don't you just do it on your own? Well, it's not going to work. Uh, we know, those of you are familiar with the lawsuit with the city of Des Moines over drinking water. Well, that's the whole problem. Uh, the agribusiness says, well, let's just, let's just do it voluntary. Yeah. Well, it's that's not, not working. It doesn't work, guys. We, voluntary doesn't work. We need all of us to you know, just need to change the way we do things. It's not going to work voluntary. But that's the thing. Divestment is a fantastic strategy. We need to, that's what Stopping the pipeline is divestment. We need to keep showing, and that's what I think. We need to keep showing. We need artists. We need, we need writers to keep uh, people in theater to help to keep help us imagine how dirty fossil fuel is. And we, we we're not seeing kind of again. Think of the anti-smoking uh, market, the marketing, and helping people imagine this is not a good situation that we're in. And it's not glamorous. Uh, and then, of course, the whole set of policies that would go towards 
taxing carbon. And again, those are, I'm not, I don't know enough about those policies, but those policies are making carbon more expensive, right? People have said, well, carbon tax, carbon fees, uh, making, making those things more expensive so that then we'll figure out how to, how to adjust to it. So we'll come, we'll come, let, let's have some conversation after that. Um, so that, that's one. Okay. So next, what, so so oh, let, I know, let me let me give you another um, uh, one more thing about why things have remained cheap. So here's an uh, ecological economist at uh, University of Vermont, uh, Robert Costanza. He was at ISU a few years ago. He said, "What we have had in the past is a market that really hasn't been telling us the truth about the costs of our activities, right?" So what we want to do is to make the market tell the truth. And as long as that, that cheap fossil fuel is creating fakeness in our economy, it's really hard to do anything good. It's really hard to, all the good things that <coughs> make sense economically aren't, help, aren't uh, play, playing out the way they ought to be. So, so, the second, so the second strategy so we have closing the door, so that's one closing the door. Second strategy and the last one was figuring a way with really ratcheting down our consumption and our cultural expectations while we're opening up the door to renewal. So this is where this is where I want to spend most time because I think this piece is totally missing from the environmental movement's language. Uh, I think everybody thinks, well, we're on fossil fuel, we're going to just close the fossil fuel. Don't worry, it will be all renewable. Well, uh, there is issues there. I think, I think it's not as simple as that. I think uh, no amount of energy, renewable or not, will ever meet an unlimited demand in a finite world. We're going to keep beating up on other people in other places renewably if we don't change. Let me give you a perfect example as I was driving up. Uh, uh, von Humboldt, who was this German explorer, and there have been books written about him. He was visiting England in 1790, and he observed that there were like ships, they were just crowded with ships, the London port was crowded with ships. It turns out in 1790, there were 15,000 vessels that came annually to London Port. What were they carrying? Stuff. Stuff from all over the world. All renewably. <laughs> and they were inflicting damage on the world renewably. They were, uh, they were beating up on people around the world. And Tom Humboldt went and observed that in South America and everywhere. So, just renewable, just switching to renewable isn't solving everything. Just be, just, I'm just kind of bringing that up. So there, we need to do other things. But the good news is we have we have been able to live well with far, 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 far less energy. And there, I want to show you some images of that. And I want to. So so what is so how, how do we do this? So I, I put a few bullet points. Ending frivolous and wasteful use of energy. An American way of life is negotiable. Totally negotiable. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, let's show. So I want to give you several examples. How do we build patterns of life that lead to less energy? So we're used to each of us having a car, but people before us really didn't do that. There was a very fantastic system of public transportation that we threw away. <coughs> um, a better arrangement is possible and practical. Okay, I mean it's really embarrassing. So when I, I met at U and I, I met faculty members who came there in the 60s for their interview on train to see their phone. There is no sign of it. <laughs> Nothing. None. So as late as sixties there were trains. Okay, so but but let me let's go further back next. So this is a time on the year I was born, 1959. This is the Zephyr rockets went from St. Paul to St. Louis. 
They came from Cedar Falls. You could go from St. Paul to Cedar Falls in four hours. In 1959, I can't even drive. If I drive 70 miles an hour, I can't do that right now on the highway. You see what I mean? We don't, we could dramatically reduce our energy dependence, but we need to invest in a different infrastructure. Okay? So that's part of the talk I was talking about climate, climate for unions. <laughs> It's like all the fight, all the union labor that are fighting environmental climate things. You're going to say, well, who's going to produce those tracks? And, and, and a lot of them, I'll show you some electrified trains too. Okay, oh, oh, there we go. So then, yeah, next one. This is Sioux City, 1948, electric trolleys. Most Iowa cities had electric trolleys. Next. Ah, my own uh, <laughs> University of Northern Iowa on College Hill corner of 23rd and College in 1890. Here's the tracks, and those are the electric lines overhead. We have totally regressed. Because we could, because we have the fossil fuel credit card, we can do anything we want. We gotta, we gotta start. So we need a movement that says, look, this, is, this doesn't make sense. We can't sustain this level of energy consumption, right? Uh, massive energy and material conservation. So here's what, uh, the, the idea that I want to leave you with, which, which again, I think is missing in the environmental movement. We not only need renewable energy, we need less energy. Less energy. And it, it's not a popular topic uh, somehow, because again, we have this vision that things are going to be great, uh, so, as Naomi Klein says, the good news is that many of these changes are distinctly uncatastrophic. <laughs> Unlike climate change. You know, to have a closed line, that's not very catastrophic, is it? You know, uh, riding the bus, that's not catastrophic. And some of them are actually downright exciting. Like riding the train. <laughs> Creating community patterns that work for us and enhance ecosystem services. Uh, so, yeah, next, that's it. That's all. This is another trolley, a brand new trolley in Philadelphia. I wrote at a city planning conference. Next, uh, Amtrak. What is left of it is still very good. I, I write it as much as I can if I'm going anywhere that, that Amtrak goes. I went to a conference in Portland, Oregon, from Minneapolis was fantastic, next. And okay, so again, back to where are we, where are we thinking? Because we want to stop the, the pipeline, which is, we have to, we really have to. Because all of, anything else I'm talking about is irrelevant if we're not stopping the pipeline, because it's not gonna happen. But, as we, again, as we shut the door, we need to also keep thinking, well, are we telling our elected officials that we want investment in other good infrastructure that's going to help us. Look at where the money is going over the last, I don't have the very latest one, but I looked up these, uh, how much money we're putting into highways, aviation, but Amtrak, very little, right? So it's going to take that kind of investment next. Um, these are all kind of public ways of doing things. Now, even though we, a lot of times you know, we focus on well, what I'm driving, what I put on, my, on the roof of my house, which is good, but really the urgency of the situation doesn't lend itself to personal to say, well, I'm, I'm really good because I'm doing all this good stuff. But it really, we need system-wide investment, really. I think that's what's going to take. And just like we're doing the pipeline, where we're, we're saying, look, we've got to stop this. Um, so next, uh, so next, uh, and, and here's other. The city of Waverly on the Cedar River, just north of Cedar Falls. There are three small hydro plants there. They've been there since 1900. And I've visited them. They're still running. And they're running very little maintenance. And they, back then, they provided a big chunk of cities. Electricity now is like 5%. But that's, that's still 5% that can run the sewer plant, can run the fire station, can run the, the hospital, right? Um, so, uh, so there are still ways of doing things, right? But we got to really cut back. So some of the personal 
things, again, we need policies that encourage people to do these things. A lot of towns really still don't have those things. It's hard to say, well, yeah, I can afford to do this, but we've got to keep thinking large scale up things. Everything. Next, um, solar hot water. All of these are well known technologies have been around. I'm an engineer. They've been around since the 70s. I mean, 40 years, and you don't see them. Why aren't you seeing solar hot water in this climate? It just, it's a piece of cake. It's totally, totally reliable. Next, uh, uh, commute. So, this is an AmeriCorps program that I run. At you and I were in seven Iowa communities. We do help low income residents save energy, uh, keep their money in their pocket. Uh, go, go through several of these uh, quickly. Uh, next, the team of team of AmeriCorps members who come and spend a year with us and bring in our great year. This is an example of a community doing an infrared image of the whole town and then figuring out which houses lost a bunch of heat, like this house, this is a well-insulated one, this is not, and then we targeted them with incentives and said, we'll help you do that. Okay, next. Okay, so, so I want to come back Towards the end, at the end of my conversation here, uh, so that we can have more discussion together. So um, here, is, here is what uh, here is what Naomi Klein says. Says we have shown ourselves willing to collectively sacrifice in the face of threats many times before. We've shown that most famously, embracing rationing, right? Victory gardens and uh, victory bonds during World War I and World War II. So she has some interesting statistics. She says during World War II, pleasure driving was virtually eliminated in the UK. Wow, the week, the pleasure driving is not big here, right? <laughs> and between 1933 and 1944, use of public transit went up 87% in the US and 95% in Canada. Wow, so we can't do it. If we want to, if this credit card isn't in our pocket, right? 20 million households, three-fifths of the population of this country were growing victory gardens in 1943. Isn't that amazing? And their yields accounted for 42% of fresh vegetables consumed that year. I, I really think these are very inspiring. That there are things we can do, we're just not, we haven't perceived the threat yet, right? We, we all, there was an agreement, we agreed that there was a threat and we all acted on it. But right now it's just like, that's why we're here again. Because we're trying to build a movement that, hey, this isn't working. Things aren't working the way they are. And, and all of those activities together dramatically reduce carbon emissions, too, back then. Um, so again, we perceived an emergency, and we acted on it. That's what we need to do. And we really need, we really need many, many of us, uh, many, uh, many, many our sensibilities, you know, whether uh, engineers, artists, writers, uh, we need to have plays about this to help people imagine. Um, so uh, this is uh, Richard Heinberg who has been thinking about the, our predicament. Since Americans who have become accustomed to the idea that anyone should be able to use as much energy as they want, whenever they want, for whatever purpose, and it should be cheap, uh, will face a different reality in an energy-constrained future. And an energy-constrained future is the future we want to create. <laughs> because right now, we're not energy-constrained, right? Pipelines, all this stuff, right? So, uh, in a sane world, we would not blow the tops of mountains in Appalachia to keep coal-burning power plants uh, belching pollution so that office towers can leave the lights on all night, right? I see that you and I, a lot of places, like at midnight, what's going on? Uh, from motorized paper towel dispensers and illuminated empty parking lots to worse inefficiencies of suburban sprawl, 
there are worlds of energy wasting products, activities, and living arrangements that can be and, and should be simply abandoned. You know, uh, so um, so that's really. I don't know. So I guess so. Here, let's go to a few of these images. I guess. Ah. But this is what I wanted to show you of what is possible if, again, not, not just saying, wow, well, I'm so cool, but what is possible. So uh, Cedar Falls Utilities did an energy audit of our house. And here, here, this was the line. Your energy use intensity, which is a mix of electricity and natural gas, per square foot over the last 12 months was 12 kilo BTUs per square foot. This is much lower than the Midwest average of 49 kilo BTUs per square foot. That's 75% less. And my house is, was a rental house that we fixed up, and we have solar hot water, stuff like it. Nothing, there's nothing unusual uh, about it. But again, if the right policies were in place, we could do a lot more, right? Next, uh, divestment. <laughs> Next, this divest and pass and gas. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, send localized food system. Next, these are all ways of divesting. So, I guess what I wanted to end with was we need to imagine a better, you know, better practical options through arts, history, drama, literature, and science. We need to uh, do the next. Uh, that we need to tell stories of what's happening to us. I, I don't think we so we need we need to tell more stories. And it's great these pipeline protests were telling stories, right? It gives us a platform to tell stories that this is a things aren't right. This is we're not gonna put up with this. Uh, next uh, uh, we need to imagine our history, history of the places we 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 how how we used to live. I think we've we've through generational loss and, and, and the fossil fuel credit card has has uh, has uh, dulled our imagination about how to be, how to live here. I love this picture because it's in on the Cedar River in Cedar Falls where there was an ice house and that ice house is still there. Where people cut ice from the river and you you know put it in their ice boxes. It was a thriving ice industry in every town in the upper Midwest. And that's how people kept their food cool. And I still think there is a lot of I'm trying to do a big project on revisiting ice making and having walking coolers and stuff for farms for vegetables instead of burning fuel. But anyway, so but a lot of historical ways that we were here can can be helpful to us as we think about living with fewer resources. Next. And we need to help realize that this isn't glamorous. This requires beating up on other people, eventually, right? Not places. Frugality should be a common word that we're going to celebrate. We're going to say, we're going to do a lot better. Next. And so that these are the kind of things I think about. How, if, if we want to use less fuel, are we building places that invite us to walk? This is an old neighborhood in our in our town, just a typical neighborhood. Next. But these are the kind of neighborhoods we're making right now, also in Cedar Falls. No trees, nothing. Can we go back? Can we go back? Nope. Can we go back? One more. So at 2 p.m. on a hot summer day, I can walk from my house to downtown and be almost entirely in the shade. Kids can play outside, they don't need air conditioning, okay? But now, go to the next. In this neighborhood, people will say, well, but this is just a new neighborhood. Yeah, but there's no trees. If 30 years you come back, it's gonna look like this. There's not gonna be any shade. Yeah, there's like one, two, you know, kind of, right? A couple of trees there. So that's what I'm saying. What, this is what I'm saying. We need to build patterns in our community that encourage us to use less energy. Okay? And this is what's going to take. The same with biking. Next. So this is a typical street, which, which could be in any town. How could this be transformed? Next. All of a sudden saying, oh, well, this is cool. 
All it took some paint and a few trees. <laughs> you know, it's a, a way of thinking. We, unfortunately, a lot of planners uh, aren't thinking about things, or some towns are doing a lot better than others. Next. And okay, so and last, I wanted to end with a few images from from past uh, big efforts to mobilize, right? And that's why, I, and I think that effort is right now missing a little bit. Uh, we don't have, we haven't, but we're just beginning to. I really think there's a lot of potential for art and storytelling and to remind us, but, but we need to do it differently, maybe. So the messages may be different uh, dealing with fossil fuels. So I, I have a few that are pretty interesting. So, so music, well, first of all, you know, every garden and munition plant, but you know, I love the idea of yeah, frugality, use it up, wear it up, make it do, right? Next. Serve on the home front, and that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're doing, we're serving on the home front right now. Trying to, trying to stop at the, at the standing rock, you know, hey, let's protect, this is, this is our, this is our land, this is our place, this is where we live. Right? It's just a, it's just a different. The context was different, but some of the messages. I love this one from. This was from Pennsylvania, by the way, which is a big fracking state right now. You know, it, it's ironic, ironic that uh, you know it's like okay, what are people doing in Pennsylvania? We know what people did in New York, right? In New York, they banned fracking, and they 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 took that up. I love that one too. You know, this time we're all on the front line, right? The, the damage of the fossil fuel industry is everywhere. Everywhere, right? We're all on the front line. But, but again, the context of these were different. But I just think there's a lot of potential. I love the next one. Next. Oh, well, the, you know, this is good too. These are, you know, I'm patriotic, you know, don't waste, right? Those are, okay, next. This is my favorite. When you ride a horses, you ride the good horses. How about when you ride the horses alone, you're riding with uh, the good horses. call the access. The other one encourages you know, car sharing, ride sharing. So, um, so kind of to summarize, I, I think that was my last slide. So, so to summarize, I, again, I keep thinking there's basically three categories of work, shutting the door on fossil fuels, figuring out how to change our culture, and opening the door to renewable. But let me emphasize this. We can't do changing our culture and doing renewables until we really, really significantly shut the door, which is what this is about. We gotta stop more investment in customers. We just gotta do it. And we need all of our creativity to make that a cultural movement. And all, all of these. Yeah. And I, I think maybe we've made more progress in opening up the door. I think there is we all can and, and the technology is there, we, do, we have a lot of things we can we know that's doable. But this the stopping the fossil fuel and changing our ways is gonna be the toughest. But we're up for it. Right. So thanks for being here, and I'd love to hear from you. breakfast with a coal company executive in West Virginia. And the first thing he said to me was... By the happens on the train. I've met all kinds of people on the train. Yeah. yeah. And he says, and I mentioned those in Illinois, he said, you know, the fourth largest coal producing state. He says, I believe there is a place for renewables but he says we need to patch in the gaps for like solar and and wind. But and he said he thought, well, it's where clean coal is. And I've got a couple of questions. First of all, is there such a thing as clean coal? Uh, nope. <laughs> no. 
I didn't think so. And secondly, was he kind of like really stretching it for the gaps we have in solar and, and, and winds? Yeah. Great question. All I say, well, you know, it's not always windy, it's not always sunny. Uh, I don't think we can really answer that question fully unless we look at demand as well. Okay. So, uh, again, energy issues are often framed in terms of supply. Where can we get more of this, right? Where is our energy going to come from? Well, come from to do what? Right? For what demand? Have we thought about our demand? Can we reshape our demand to meet the solar income? Again, the goal is if we're going to shut the door on fossil energy, there is really only one income. It's called the solar income. Right? We've got to figure out how to live within our means. That's all we've done. And so we can't keep that, you know, and it's a, well, I got to, so it's like, well, if I want to do my laundry and hang my clothes out to dry, I wait. When it's sunny, I hang my clothes out. So I shape man to meet the supply. Uh, the current economy that we have with the, with the power plant running, they're called base load. We're just running. Uh, it's kind of like having your car in the driveway and it's just running all the time in case you have to go to the grocery store. You see what I mean? So we, we're going to figure out a whole change a bunch of things. But yeah, right now, if you say, well, can we just right now switch everything, remove the coal, we will be patching Probably. But we could create a different infrastructure that would not do that if we reduce our demand significantly. But that's how I understand it. Also, the huge power fucking trains all the time. And they're electrified, too. They are, yes. And they're also doing diesel now and all work and low emissions. Yes, there's a question. Hi. Welcome to Boone County. I'm in Southern Boone County. Proud of Bakken Pipeline Fighter. I can't keep a full time job, so I keep it between Iowa State and Drake. And I'm here to give my students a message of hope because they're kind of down but I'm happy to tell them about all of you. I have solar panels on my barn roof. It, it's not radical technology. I make more electricity than I use, but I think the sticky with it is in transportation. Not everybody can buy an electric car. I'm working on it. Is there another fuel that would be renewable? Maybe compressed methane that we could use in transportation, or, or is it going to be electric cars? And I grew up riding trains, love them. A lot, there's a lot of things to work out, but um, and, and the idea of electric cars very really attractive and, and everything. Um, I really, I think we need to think again bigger uh, in terms of how how we move people around, uh, not necessarily personally uh, as I showed you. Uh, it's possible to have a good network of transportation, public transportation, so that we don't have to each on a car, with a big battery, with tires, with this, that, the other, all, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, personally, I, I can't wrap my head around more of the same vehicles, roads, I don't, I don't know if we can sustain that versus public transportation. It's, it's gonna be a big, it's gonna be shift, there's gonna be some sort of a shift. I don't, I don't know if we figured all of those out. But again, we don't, but I don't think we have a lot of options. I mean, the option is we don't want this stuff needs to go and what, what, I mean, the, in Iowa, the, the politically acceptable kind of supposedly renewable fuel is, uh, you know, biofuel based on corn, which is just totally, totally uh, high grade. I and mean, it's just, good. Yeah, so, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so I think what you're saying is exactly right, that it's really unfair to put it on the individual consumer. Obviously there are things that we can and should all be doing in our own lives to improve our sustainability in the home. But it really has to come from government. I mean, it really has to be something that is not controlled by the markets, and I think that's a common thing to hear for a lot of people. We cannot live. Uh, figure it out, it's not gonna be business as usual. And I did read 19 Klein's book, 
and I think she makes a really strong argument for this coming uh, from above. Um, especially, I, I don't think you mentioned this in your presentation, but meat consumption in the United States. I mean, that's got to be something on the eye of mind, right? But the methane released from cows, methane is more potent than carbon dioxide, and cows release more uh, greenhouse gas than all of the cars on our roads. But it's very difficult to ask every individual to stop eating meat, and that's what they want to. We have a huge thirst for blood in America. But I was, my question, I guess, to get to the bottom of it, is how do you envision um, some of these difficult choices being made by our government? I mean, what we're talking about is really re-envisioning capitalism. Because if, if you're going to ask the markets to change, you're controlling the markets with government. How do you, because that comes from the people asking their government to make those changes, um, how is that going to happen? When people do a lot more kind of strategy experience, <laughs> uh, strategy experience, do you, so I don't know, do you want to, you want to answer that? I mean, but your, but your question is, is a great question. Uh, and Sandra, what's that? Okay, you want to speak to that? Yeah, please, yeah. We do need to be better. That's for sure. Yeah. She's hoping that the government would maybe pass the right laws that would make these things happen. Right now, that's not possible because in Citizens United case, where the big corporations as persons use the Second Amendment and their money as their free speech, we now have both parties taking that money. So don't count on the senators and representatives to do that. Uh, I know. Don't call on the, I get a lot of help, but we're all in this together. <laughs> Don't count on the big government to do that because they're listening to the money right now. We have to do this, what, what we're doing now, vocally. Train ourselves, get busy on local government, and move it up to eventually. But in the meantime, the kind of things you're doing, I think of the song, Happy Days, are here again as an old song. We're gonna a lot of this is going back pre the kind of stuff that we're doing now. So uh, don't count on the government. Get out and do it locally. We are working strong locally. I think it's um, good for us to say all of the above. You know, working to stop the bomb trains, working to stop the coal, the fracking, it's all part of the same, you know, we have a toolbox with lots of tools and we need to use them all. But one that I'm fascinated with that I'm just learning about more now is the, um, a lot of people say in order to close the door on fossil fuels, you've got to price carbon. And the model that some of us like so far is the fee and dividend. And the dividend group is uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. And if you go to their website, you can see how it's a way of pricing it at the source. And then because the, the people that own the source will charge us more, but then the fee comes back to every household on a regular basis. Very good that they require to the law. Well, they now have 10 Republicans in the House and 10 Democrats, and they're growing that one and one because they want to keep it bipartisan. So we have one Republican representative in Illinois who has signed on to that talk, that belief that being dividend. They've been writing hundreds of op-eds across the country for about five years. Their numbers, if you listen to their annual report, it's really uh, impressive. So it's another major tool. We, we need to use all the tools we can. I'm going to pass the mic back to him. Yeah. Uh, there is a spectrum of actions we could take, and you need to kind of find where your passion, where you're most comfortable uh, becoming active in, in, in that line of work. Yes, sorry. You. A few things. One is we put a man on the moon in less than 10 years. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. True. Yeah. No, I thought I said you could, we put that, a man on the moon. Why not put them all on the moon? That's what. I <laughs> put some women there too. Um, another thing is with the, the fossil fuels. 
What's been going on is that companies have been going around the globe colonizing nations and creating the terrorists that tell us we have to fight and have our, our wars about, okay? And they're using our children, they're using them as cannon fodder. Okay, those costs are not included in the cost of fossil fuels, okay? The cost of the pollution is not included. So when they talk about carbon tax, it's not just to uh, make it more expensive, it's to actually deal with some of the costs of this. It's nuts. Um, another thing is that if you don't have an environmental commission in your town or your city, get one going, okay? They're doing that more and more, and you've got to have them paying attention. In Davenport, where I live, they're using geothermal in almost all the schools. The demand reduction, which is just cut it back, that's a good way to remember it. Demand reduction is huge with that, absolutely huge. I financed an installation in, in uh, Illinois uh, uh, about 15, 20 years ago. They reduced their use by 60% with a ground source heat pump, geothermal, okay? Our buildings leak like sieves. You can do an energy audit. Mid-American uh, uh, will do one for you for free, and they give you the fluorescent light bulbs, and they give you some insulation, and they give you all sorts of tips as to what you can do to, to reduce your demand. The other thing is that the sustainable energy uh, technologies are here. Solar panels have gotten a lot less expensive. Okay, there it currently is a 30% federal tax credit that's against your income. That's huge. And for businesses, there's accelerated depreciation of 85% of the cost. That means they can take on a $100,000 installation, they can take $85,000 and deduct it from their income that they're taxed on. Okay, it pays for itself in like five or six years for commercial interest, okay? Uh, the, the wind turbine technology is improving, and you're right. Ethanol from corn, Monsanto corn, is ridiculous. We need to push for, uh, for uh, industrial hemp. That's the most productive. Just one quick thing for people local. Um, Carolyn, you want to raise your hand there? So there is a team of folks that have been working together in just one the creation of a citizen sustainability task force for the city of Des Moines that is guiding Des Moines to a net uh, greenhouse gas emissions goal. Um, and part of that over the next year is um, really working to push the city who's in the process of revising our zoning code to really rethink the zoning code to do just exactly what you were talking about. So if people who in Des Moines are interested in being part of that, um, we, you know, talk to me or Carolyn. Um, we can also talk to CPI if they want to let folks know about it as well. Um, but there's going to be a lot of stuff happening to really move at least the city of Des Moines in that direction. Thanks, everybody. We're out of time. We'll be around. Thanks. Great, great thoughts. <laughs>